the organic division is uh, formed by six faculty and here they are in alphabetical order. And we do recover mostly uh, all branches of inorganic chemistry in different flavors. So we go from molecules to crystals, from films to nanomaterials, from um, fun very fundamental studies of reactivity and bonding to things that are more applied like uh, catalysis or microelectronics. And in all those areas, we, uh, I think we do, we do very well. And what I'm going to do now is go very briefly over uh, the research that each one of us uh, does uh, in the inorganic division. So I'm going to get started with Matt. Uh, Matt uh, does uh, lanthanide based uh, organometallic chemistry and also bio inorganic. So in, the, in, in this group, uh, there are two ma major uh, lines of research right now. One is the development of uh, uh, coordination complexes containing lanthanides for magnetic resonance imaging, so chemical sensing, uh, and of course, developing the science behind, the chemistry behind, uh, that, behind that sensing. So every time you have uh, sensing agents, you, there are always barriers that need to be overcome in terms of sensitivity, uh, response time, and that's what uh, that's what they do in, in Matt's group. The other line of research is the development of water-stable lanthanide complexes for asymmetric catalysis. So there are a series of reactions that, uh, organic reactions that occur in solution and that are catalyzed by, by lanthanide complexes, and they try to develop uh, they try to develop that, that type of catalysts using some of the knowledge they have acquired uh, in the first line of research, which is lanthanide complexes for uh, MRI imaging. So they do a bit of everything, including organic synthesis, voltammetry, fluorescence, uh, NMR. So that, that, type of, that type of chemistry is what they do there. Uh, then I go to Stephanie. Stephanie is... Uh, a materials person, so she does uh, research on materials and right now mostly nano nanomaterials. And there are two major areas of, of focus of, the, of her research. One is uh, group 15 nanoparticles, so nitrides, phosphides, arsenides, uh, and they want to uh, develop new methods to put those, uh, to synthesize those particles, those nanoparticles uh, with a series of, in, in such a way that they meet a series of conditions. For example, in terms of polydispersity, phase purity, and that's a synthetic challenge usually because those nanoparticles, they tend to have a, a high degree of covalency. So it's not that simple as just precipitating stuff, stuff out. And the end goal of making those nanoparticles is using them for energy relevant applications. Uh, and as you're going to see, energy is a, uh, a theme that uh, um, is across, that cuts all of, uh, all of our research areas in all of the groups in inorganic chemistry. So they want to use that for, for, uh, for, area, for applications like magnetic refrigeration and water or an electrocatalytic water splitting. The second line of research is developing the knowledge uh, on how to assemble nanoparticles that are in principle very different. So uh, achieving ensembles of nanoparticles that can be used for energy relevant applications, for example, photovoltaics, by learning how to put together very different components. And that's, that's uh, That's, uh, a, that's a challenge in terms of developing the chemistry to bind these components into a functional art, uh, architecture. Next, we have Stas uh, Groisman. Stas is an organometallic chemist and he does coordination chemistry mostly with uh, transition metals. They also do bio-inorganic chemistry. So there is always some application uh, uh, that there, there, are, there are applications that range from catalysis to things that are more uh, related to metals in biology. And the two main, uh, two main lines of research there are group transfer chemistry uh, between in, um, transition metal containing bimetallic, compl bimetallic complexes, mostly 3D, uh, 3D bimetallic complex complexes. So group transfer 
is important in terms of for, for things like catalysis. It's, it's very important. And you may have seen that in organic chemistry at some point during, during your bachelor. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a synthetic challenge. The second uh, line of research is how to design uh, redox active uh, ligands that can help to activate very small molecules that are in principle and react and reactive. For example, nitrogen. Uh, so that's that's important for things like like catalysis. Very important. It's it's very challenging. So like you like you see here in this slide, there are things that are more applied and things that are and areas that are more fundamental. But all in all of them, what we do is like I said before, discover new chemistry. Then, well, this is this is me. So I'm a materials chemistry person, and we do a variety of materials from bulk crystals to nanomaterials to a hybrid organic inorganic uh, materials. And the two main lines of research are one is focused towards uh, lanthanide, lanthanide and transition metal containing uh, solids for <clears throat> uh, luminescence thermometry that has a variety of applications uh, from microelectronics to biosensing and also energy conversion. And the second line of research is developing new families of materials. And in this case, we are one of the lines of research we are working on now is to develop new bimetallic fluorinated precursors for the, for the solution phase synthesis of fluorinated nanoparticles, for example. So we do have quite a bit of fluorine chemistry in my group. From a, this is very fundamental perspective. So it's what I, I would call exploratory synthesis. Then we have Claudio Verani. Claudio does coordination chemistry, does coordination chemistry for the most part with transition metals, uh, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper. And the end goal of, of Claudio's research is to develop uh, metal metal containing soft materials like metal surfactants uh, or supramolecular assemblies. Those are relevant for a variety of applications, one of which is ener energy conversion. So uh, catalysis, for example, uh, and also corrosion mitigation. So I think they, they I, I'm pretty sure they have a, a project on, on corrosion going on right now. The other line of research in Claudio's group is uh, designing uh, molecular rectifiers. So uh, redox driven molecular uh, switches for molecular electronics. So you know that molecules can be used to conduct electricity that was discovered back in the 70s. And they are there is always a push to develop uh, new molecular switches. That's, that's one of um, uh, Claudio, Claudio's group uh, focuses. And then we have Chuck Winter. Chuck uh, has, uh, uh, they, they do organometallic and inorganic synthesis. And the main fog, the major focus of the research in Chuck's group is to design uh, organometallic precursors for atomic layer deposition of thin films that are relevant for uh, microelectronics. So they want to learn how to tailor the chemistry of a given molecule so that when it sublimes in an ALD reactor, it deposits, uh, it subsequently deposits as a very uh, high quality film. And uh, they also do, they do uh, atomic layer deposition in their own lab here, uh, mostly of metal and metal nitride films. So uh, a, bit of, a bit of inorganic and organometallic chemistry there. This is molecular, it's not materials. It's, the end is materials, but the chemistry itself is, is molecular chemistry. And these are some of the funding agencies that support our research uh, from all the six faculty that I've shown before. So uh, we have federal funding. We also have corporations and we, we have industry funding. These are some of the, of the agencies and companies that support us. Collaborations, there are all sorts of collaboration, uh, collaboration uh, opportunities in, in our groups. Uh, inside the department, at Wayne State and outside the department and outside the country, so overseas. We have collaborators in Spain, for example, uh, in Italy. Uh, and you know how research works uh, nowadays, so it's impossible for one lab to do everything. So the idea is that you are exposed to those collaborations. We also have industrial collaborations, BASF, uh, Cabot, and Applied Materials. For it. Those are some examples, right? 
uh, question. Is CO2 useful uh, in energy? No, in my lab, we don't do any sort, any type of uh, CO2 conversion. That's more uh, along the lines of what Stas Groisman uh, does. Next. Uh, so in terms of instrumentation, here what I have is um, a list, a very brief list of the major pieces of equipment that we use. And here I've listed only shared equipment. So we have, a, we have you probably got a tour of the Lumigen Center where we have the big uh, shared uh, instrumentation facilities. And in the inorganic division, these are the major pieces of instrumentation, of shared instrumentation that we use, diffractometers, NMRs, XPS, uh, electron microscopes. We just got funded for a new electron microscope that's going, that's going to be operational uh, in April or May. And then we use uh, ICP MS uh, analysis for elemental analysis. We all, all of us uh, do this. And we also make quite a bit of use of the facilities offered at national labs, especially synchrotron sources and neutron sources to do structural an uh, analysis of, of crystal structures. So uh, eventually you will be, de depending on what group you, you choose, you join, uh, you're going to be exposed to those techniques and you're going to get to travel to national labs. Some, uh, some journals where we publish, and I've, I just took some examples from the past uh, four years. Uh, so these are very good journals. They are top journals in the, in the field. So. I think we do we do with research, it's solid. And in terms of where our alum, uh, alumni uh, go, here I took the list from the past, I think seven years and you see where they go. So they go to industry, they also go to national labs or, or government organizations, usually after doing postdocs. And they also go into, in, into education, right from, uh, larger universities to smaller colleges, you know, four-year colleges, but uh, there is a variety there of places where um, our students end up going. So I think it gives you a, a, a perspective of what uh, the professional development opportunities are once you have your, your PhD in your hands. And, and that's pretty much it. So I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. All right, uh, I'll go first. Um, specifically uh, about your research on um, the luminescence um, thermometers, what are some of the applications of those uh, thermometers? So uh, those are used to measure temperature in places where you cannot use contact thermometry. For example, in a cell there, you need to inject a luminescent nanoparticle so that you can measure temperature. Or for example, in a turbine blade, that is rotating and you cannot stick a thermocouple. So you need uh, other, other types of uh, thermometry approaches and that's where luminescence uh, thermometry enters. Other questions? Go ahead, don't be shy. So there's a question in the um, in the chat, okay. and um, they they asked, "Is the instrumentation easily accessible, or does okay. there end up being a bottleneck for projects because of the filled schedule for instrument use?" That's an excellent question. Thanks for asking. Uh, so this is much more interesting if you guys ask a bunch of questions than having me just speak there. So. Uh, no, uh, the question is, uh, there is no uh, bottleneck for you to get uh, your project going because, the, because it's hard to access the instrumentation. One of the things that we are very proud of is the Lumigen Instrument Center, which is very professionally run. And we make sure first that you are trained. So you will be trained on the instruments pri prior to giving you access. And once you are given access, uh, you will operate the instrument on your own so that you become proficient because that's one of the skills that you want to get out of your PhD, right? Instrumentation skills. And one of the things I, I very much like about the, the LIC is that, of course, if you're running to travel, there's going to be 
uh, a staff member to help you. But uh, what 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 I like is that staff members here, all of them are P they have PhD degrees. So that is very important. I've been in places where the staff members were not were not PhDs, and it's it's never a good idea. Uh, so here we 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 pay them well enough uh, that they do a very good job, and there is no uh, there is no uh, instrument that I know of in which you have a lag in terms of uh, getting getting your data. So very good question. And one more thing is that we keep updating instruments, right? So every year we submit uh, a proposal to a, a federal agency to keep uh, the to get a new instrument, to update an instrument, because that's that's a that's a permanent effort, right? So that's how we got the new TEM, for example. Other questions? Uh, hey, I have one question. So. Uh, this is Ferris Ahmed, and uh, I have a question about halogenated ligand about your research area. So I really am uh, curious about the halogenated ligands, like what's the main prospect of halogenated ligands and what's what's new uh, about this ligands? Because it's uh, something like it's going to emitting some lights. So it's interesting for me. So what so, a future prospect or future application, what uh, people haven't done before. So the idea is to create a new family of materials that has uh, two different uh, perspectives. One is we can use those uh, halogenated ligands or materials containing halogenated ligands to decompose them in solution and make halogenated crystals uh, mm -hmm. that could be used for luminescence, for example. And the other uh, perspective is to have those uh, halogenated ligand containing materials emit light themselves. That could be interesting for a variety of applications, including biosensing. All right, all right, yeah. Thank you so much for clarifying this information. Thank you. Yeah, other questions? Anything goes, so don't be shy. I guess I have another. Um, with all this funding, what does the average research group size look like for the inorganic department? Because it looks like you guys are well, well funded compared to some of the other presentations I've seen so far. So um, the average, uh, it's hard to define an average size, but for example, I think right now my group is five. Uh, Stephanie, I think she's five, Chuck, is maybe a little bigger because he has postdocs, maybe seven. Um, Claudio is maybe around five, two, and Stas is either five or six. So uh, we don't have in the inorganic division armies, so we have groups, uh, meaning that you will have, and but that's that's not just the inorganic division, it's the whole department, right? Uh, so we don't build empires, we build research groups. And that's, that's a way also of keeping the relationship between the, advi the advisor and the students collegial, uh, which uh, it's up to you, right? But that's something that I like. All right, thank you for clearing that up. I know um, when I go onto some of y'all's research pages, I see like armies of people, like 20 plus. I'm like, what is that? Goodness, that's a lot. 20, maybe that picture is not uh, up to date because I don't recall anybody having 20 people. Maybe, I think the largest group right now here in chemistry, maybe 13 or 14 or something like that. I like that phrase that you use though, that we, we build groups, not armies. It's, it's true. <laughs> One more question in the chat, okay. Uh, do you have a crystallographer in the department? We have someone uh, who is in charge of the crystal, of the, the the single crystal X-ray machine, and she can solve structures for you. But uh, it is uh, the preference of the PIs uh, that use a single crystal machine that uh, she trains you uh, into structural solving, and then you get you acquire the skill 
of solving crystal structures on your own, because that's something that you will car carry uh, after uh, graduation and that's it's important to have. You're not going to make a career out of solving crystal structures, but it's a good skill to have. So uh, we have someone in charge of the single crystal X-ray diffractometer. Yes, and she can train you on data collection and analysis. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. To, oh, another question? Maybe, maybe someone's typing. Maybe we have three more minutes, I don't know. Uh, Go ahead and ask. All right. Well, I will be circulating everyone's that spoke today the emails. If you have additional questions, you can reach out to Dr. Rebuffetti and ask him some more questions that way. Um, but uh, our our time that we allotted for this meeting is coming to it has come to an end. So I'm gonna switch gears and uh, and say thank you for your time. Oh. Let okay. a couple more people in the room. Bye, Federico. Okay. Bye. Um, and I like to say we saved the best for last. We've invited um, five of our current graduate students here to talk with you about some of the things that I think are important. Um, the big three topics that I listed for our session today were the first year experience, because we want you to know what it's like to be a first year student here. Um, but also we want we want to be able to hear a little bit from them about their experiences in finding housing in the Metro Detroit area. And also what was it like coming here to be a, a teaching assistant? What is it like teaching Wayne State undergrads? Um, so I would like to do a couple of introductions. Um, we have Courtney Cunningham, who is a first year student in the analytical division. I see Hanalich, who is a second year student in, oh, I'm getting all confused. You're organic. Gary's biochem. You're organic. Okay. Gary Leonard is here from the first year. He's a biochemistry student. Shiraz Nanagonia, he is here from the physical division, right? Yes, I did. I get this all right. I'm doing so good. And Shiraz is a second year student. And Frederica, his, Frederica Morgan is here from the inorganic division. And Frederica, are you? Four, you're four. Whoa, just crossing the threshold. Frederica is joining us here as well. Um, she's a fifth year student. Um, and 